Greetings, truth seekers, paradigm busters, new world order, civil disobedience, freedom fighters, free thinkers, higher mammals, good people of all types. How's it going? My name is Michael Parker, and welcome to episode 32 of The Electric Pyramid, coming to you as always from an undisclosed location somewhere in Hollywood, California. And ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are, it is either Thursday, January the 22nd, or Friday morning, January the 23rd, and... Based upon what I just monitored, um, I don't know how it sounded to the audience. The audio was a little warbly, but that's actually a good kind of segue into what we're going to be speaking about for a few minutes. At about 15 minutes after, we will be joined by Debbie Chestnut, who is a psychic medium and a uh, paranormal investigator. But first, one thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is this idea of Mercury retrograde and some of you may be into astrology, some of you may not, some of you may think it's bunk, but um, we are in Mercury retrograde as of yesterday, and a lot of times in social media or in uh, conversations, you may hear people go, oh my God, it's, it's Mercury retrograde, what am I going to do? Well, guess what? Mercury retrograde gets a little bit of a bad rap. And if you're wondering what Mercury retrograde is, it's a bit of an optical illusion. Um, a couple of times, a few times a year, usually three times a year, if you were to look at the solar system, it appears that Mercury passes the Earth in its orbit. And as it rounds around the bend, Mercury appears to slow down, stop, and spin backwards. Of course, that's not what, what's happening, but that's what it would look like, kind of as if you, when you approach a car coming the opposite direction, uh, the way it looks. Anyway, make a long story short, what you will usually hear about Mercury retrograde is how things just get massively screwed up. Um, communications, lots of miscommunications, um, your trains, your planes, your transportation is late. Um, essentially, anything having to do with communication or transportation, mechanical items seem to have snafus associated with them. Well, that's that does happen a lot. However, there is a good side of Mer Mercury retrograde. And one way you can kind of remember it is to think of this, Mercury retrograde. So it starts with an RE, right? So during a retrograde period, it's good to kind of do things to start with RE, which is rethink, review, revamp, uh, renew, rethink. It's a reunions. Um, the good thing about Mercury retrograde, it's a good time to revisit things from the past. Look at things that you've been doing that you need to finish. Think about um, people that you from your past that you, perhaps you need to get back in touch with. Um, ideas. Are you, are you writing something? Are you writing a play? Are you writing a piece of music? Are you creating a contract? Um, are you writing a script? Something like that. These are great times to revisit those things and finish them. The things you don't want to do during a Mercury retrograde um, are you don't want to sign contracts um, without a thorough review of them. Wait if you can. You don't want to start brand new things unless you have to. Um, you don't want to shoot your mouth off quickly. You want to think about everything you say. You want to think of before you, before you push that send button on that email, make sure that you've read through it and make sure you're saying what you mean. Um, because Mercury is the sign of communication and in Mercury retrograde periods, you always hear about miscommunications or messages that did not get received. Um, people misinterpret things. You may think you're speaking clearly, but people will misinterpret you. So there's a, a good side to this that you often don't hear about, and it can actually be a good time to finish things. So do you need to clean out a closet? Do you need to finish a paper? Do you need to reach out to an old friend? Do you need to finish some project that you've been working on? Do you need to get your car tuned up? Do you need to uh, plan something 
maybe related to a reunion or a, an appointment or a meeting. These, this is a good time to do this. And Mercury retrograde lasts three weeks. And it started yesterday, although it also has what they call a shadow period, which is you know, a week or, so, week or two on each side of it as well. And a friend of mine once time uh, told me, W.C. Moriarty, uh, a great astrologer and friend, he once told me that he found the most dangerous times of Mercury retrograde to be the day that begin Mercury retrograde and the day that end retrograde. Those seem to be the days when things got the wackiest. Um, but still, you know, you, you hear a lot of bad things about it, and but you can use it to your advantage as long as you kind of look at it from the point of view of, I'm going to finish things. I'm not going to start things. Now, that being said, if you're looking for a job right now and someone offers you a job and you have to take it, well, then you take it. You don't do, you don't do things that are against your own best interest. If, if you need to initiate something and it's going to put bread on your table, money in your, in your wallet, when they need to do that, just know that, you know, there may be some issues surrounding it that you were not initially expecting. So just wanted to put that out there because that's what's going on. Also, I just read a little while ago, this has nothing to do with Mercury retrograde. <laughs> but um, by the way, I, I hear my man Joe laughing. How are you doing, brother I Joe? It. Yeah, you doing, my main man. I was <laughs> I hoping okay. we were going to roll into a little Mercurius Trismegustus, you know, a little, little hint of Hermes, that's God's messenger. Well, you know what? That's exactly what we're talking about. And yeah. uh, I, know, Mercury- I was loving it. And you know what? The chat room, too. Uh, Tracy in the chat room, chat room was making a few comments. Uh, it was Let fantastic. It. And, and I agree. It was, it, was, uh, it was brilliant. Good stuff. Well, well you know what? I, I am – I enjoy it, astrology. It's very interesting because just today I said to my a – few, a few weird things just out of my norm in my life. We just yep. – enough for me today to say – is it a new moon today? Where it are was we yesterday. with this? Something was not right. Enough yeah. for me to think where the moon cycle was, what's, what's what. And it's so interesting that you say uh, it went, Mars went retrograde yesterday because it was uh, enough for me to be aware of it early in the day today. That's well, uh, fantastic. Yeah, we, and, uh, we thank have- you for telling me that. You're welcome. Um, you're right. We also have a new moon. So we are in the first couple of days of a new moon period. So listen, I, you guys, I don't, I don't live every second of my life according to astrology, but I just find it interesting. And well, I, I, mean, I, 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 the more, the more I grow, the more I learn, I find it harder for me to not acknowledge that these planetaries or moons and or moons have an influence. No, I, uh, on uh, on on us, I, I on anything. I, I find it. Um, well, Joe, the people that you're really into had a great deal of reference for the oh, place. Absolutely, of, I mean, of, they would go on and on bodies. about it. You know, the the simple ones for children, they would say, <clears throat> "You can't argue that the moon influences the tides," and That's certainly right. you never see the other side of the moon, but it surely influences the tide just as much as the other as the side you see. And that's a simple example. There's a force right there that you know is happening, and you cannot see it, nor can you explain it, that's but right. you know it's happening. That was just, you know, lesson number one. And, but uh, man, they explain it so well. It's they use, they they try to explain it with reasoning, you know, or Euclid's math, where it's mm-hmm. <clears throat> they try to rule everything out, and what you're left with is saying, well, it it has to be, you know, and um, uh, it took hundreds of years. Of, for people to put all that together. <clears throat> Excuse well, me, I'm the, losing my voice, folks. Got a little excited. No, I'm, I'm glad you did. My man Joe is uh, recovering from a bit of a little bug, but um, little bug. Hang, yeah. hang in there, brother. And chat room, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope that you will jump in on um, with some questions shortly when we, uh, we have our guest Debbie Chestnut on. She is a psychic medium and a paranormal investigator, and I'm in the midst of reading one of her books. So uh, you guys feel free to hit us with some questions once that gets rolling. But hey, I got one other thing now. This, this is not particularly important in the scheme of things, but I have to mention this because it's all over the news and I think it's a good example of Mercury retrograde. And Joe, I, you know, you and I have never, are you a football fan at all? I'm not a football fan at all. Cool. Um, <laughs> You're very cool. Yeah, I agree. Um, 
But I love well, sports. You know, I love the, sports. It's just the, the whole rules of it. It just it kind of makes no sense to me. So, well, here's the deal. The reason I bring this up is because obviously you've probably heard about this whole Patriots thing that's going on with these. Absolutely. Okay, so here's the deal. I've heard all about those dirty cheating scoundrels for years now. Yeah, and, and I'm not a fan, but that's beside the point. But um, it's just funny because in Mercury Retrograde, you got to be really careful about what you say. And what you say depending on who hears it and how you say it, can have different meanings. So today, Bill Belichick, who's the coach, and Darth Vader of the New England Patriots, and uh, Tom Brady, their quarterback, both gave separate um, press conferences regarding this scandal with, with the underinflated balls. Well, Bruce Belichick, or Bruce Belichick, Belichick has never been a particularly eloquent man. He hardly says anything and often speaks in, in monosyllabic words and short grunts. But um, Brady, on the other hand, you know, he's the all-American, you know, guy. And they did separate press uh, conferences. Anyway, Belichick basically, in my opinion, kind of threw Brady under the bus. And he also said, I have no explanation several times. Brady came on and <laughs> that was all he said. That's pretty much all he said. Yeah, yeah. You know, but at one point he makes this comment that I thought was throwing I think Brady he under the bus. once or twice as well. Well, you know, he kind of, even when he doesn't uh, grunt in a way that you can hear it, you feel like he's grunting internally. You know, it's he like feels he's making like, some how dare t- these people ask me questions. Why must I communicate? You know, right, right. Like, why? But anyway, so then Brady gets on, and Brady <laughs> makes this comment at one point where he says, you know, hey, this isn't ISIS. No one's getting killed here. Which, you know what? Hey, you're absolutely correct. But I don't know. I just thought that didn't come off well. That you he's, know, so, like, he's so unintelligent. He might have heard that expression, and, and he might not know how to use it in the correct context. Which which one? Brady? Well, Brady's, uh, which, yeah. yeah. You know? Maybe. I mean, I don't know yeah, too sometimes much about he say, What are they going to say? I mean, right? If they, if. There was something well, going on with the. Here's what I w- here's what I would say, Joe. I would say, listen. Lay it on me, bro. What do you think um, about this? I, I would I would say because actually I, I'm I'm quite curious because the way this is going to pan out, I personally feel it's just going to be another example for me on how football is just kind of just useless, you know. Like, uh, brother, you are exactly correct, and that's where I'm going with this. Okay, um, I love it, and I Ooh. and I'm a li- and I'm Ooh. this is coming. How can I butter life. this up? This is a lifetime football fan that you're talking to. Oh, well, here's sorry, the deal. brother. No, 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 no. This is this is where it's going, man. And 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 I'm not the only one saying this. The NFL, by not moving on this quickly, I mean, how hard can it be to see the chain of command of a freaking football? It's like, you know, it's like the right. fact that they've not moved on this and sorted it out is is really makes the NFL and its commissioner, uh, Goodell, look very badly. And they're dragging their feet on this because they don't. Well, there's got to be just... a couple of people involved. Like, if well, Brady was handling football somewhere, someone would say, hey, dude, what are you doing? You know, like, well, that's, that's, out of, that's not what they would normally see him doing. Well, and, and he, didn't even, he didn't even have to handle it. Other people could have done it. My only exactly. point is that... There's, is there's that with people what, in there. Yeah. The, 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 the NFL is showing itself as really a just a pretty stinky organization not that that's anything new right well i mean following um, the and what was the gentleman's name rice excuse me uh, yeah I well yeah that was a gentleman at this point but uh, yeah i mean that man knocked his woman out in a right, right. <laughs> in that's elevator. no gentleman in my book that person and, and for the longest time they did right. not want to address that and now they've got this situation i don't know how it's going to play out but no matter I, football I, players a lineup dude yeah, yeah. It, that's true, and people will line up to buy the ticket. So all I'm saying is is that um, I think it really stinks. I think it really looks bad for the NFL. And happening during Mercury Retrograde, they really need to watch what they say because, honestly, they really turned me and a lot of people off today with what they said, and the NFL is going to turn a lot of people off with how they're handling this. And I know it doesn't have anything to do with anything oh, really actually important. I love the way you just put those together. It's like I'm very excited to watch this thing pan out now. Well, I, you know, it's, uh, it's, you know, maybe it will make more bandwidth for all of us to look at more important issues in the future. But it's just, I just wanted to put out there because it is Mercury retrograde. That thing stinks. And uh, that's that. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Parker. This is the Electric Pyramid. We talk about a lot of things. And uh, one of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight, which we've been talking about for the past couple of weeks, 
here in January is uh, is paranormal investigation and ghosts and spirits, uh, residual energies, malevolent energies, demons, demonology. Um, tonight, we are going to be having on a guest named Debbie Chestnut. She is a psychic medium and the author of four books. She's going to be joining us uh, any moment, I think. And I just received a copy of her most recent book which is called Stalking Shadows, The Most Chilling Experiences of a Paranormal Investigator. And um, let me tell you a little bit about her. Is Joe, is she with us yet? No, not yet. Uh, you, okay. Hopefully Let's, about 60 seconds. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about Debbie um, yes. while we get her on board. That sounds like a deal. Yeah. Debbie Chestnut is a spiritual medium. She is a professional paranormal investigator, an author, and a lecturer. In the tradition of uh, James Von Pra and John Edwards, she has spent 30 years helping people connect with loved ones in the spiritual realm. She has the ability to see and talk to ghosts. She has been able to communicate with spirits since she was a child. She has nearly 20 years of experience as a ghost hunter and uses her unique talents to assist in investigations for those who are experiencing paranormal activity. She is the author of four books, Is Your House Haunted? So You Want to Be a Ghost Hunter, Ghosts of Anchor Bay, How to Clear Your Home of Ghosts and Spirits, and actually make that five because of the new book, which is The Most Chilling Experiences of a Paranormal Investigator, Stalking Shadows. She is going to be with us for the remainder of the show. We're loaded and, right now, my man. All right. Hi, how are you? Debbie, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Well, my name is Michael Parker. I don't know if you could hear it, but I was just telling the audience a little bit about you and reading some from your bio. I've got the uh, the copy of uh, your newest book, Stalking Shadows, which I have been reading. And I was looking today. I didn't realize that you also had so many other books. You've got four other books besides this. Yes, I do. And I was listening to some interviews with you and looking on your website, uh, which we'll be talking about. And... I, I've spoken to people uh, who are paranormal investigators in the past, um, none of whom have been also mediums. And that's something that intrigues me a great deal. When in your childhood did you know that you had this gift and ability to do that? Um, when I was about four. How did that happen? Um, in my book, Stalking Shadows, um, I talk about Nathaniel. Yes, and yes, yeah. Nathaniel was my first ghost. That's right. And my best friend <laughs> for a long time. And you talk about when you move back into the house, the uh, or when you move into the house, you discovered that Nathaniel was actually uh, mentally challenged. Yes, yes. He was, um, he died around 1853, I think. And back in those days, if you were mentally challenged, you were kept isolated. You were kept up in a, upstairs or away, away from friends and the public. And when you were taken out, you were ridiculed. Mm -hmm. So that's where he lived. Well, one of the things that kind of blows my mind when I, when I read these different stories that are in the book is when you're dealing with these spirits and you're communicating with them, and in, in some, some of these cases, like uh, the gentleman – We'll talk about it at some point in the show. The gentleman who lived in the house that was a, a bit of an evil guy and, and a rich guy. I mean, you had long conversations with this man. And yeah. I guess what, what, what blows my mind is that you, at least from the way I'm reading in the book, you don't seem to be that freaked out by it or um, you're pretty – level-headed with this kind of thing, which, I, listen, I have never experienced a ghost that I know of, um, but I think I would probably be a little uh, a little freaked out. Well, when you grow up with it, it's your normal. I guess you're right. Yeah. And I, you know, with him, um, five years, over five years, I spent hours in that house in the freezing cold. There was no heat. There was no electricity. And I'd take a blanket and a carafe of coffee, and I'd go up to the third floor, and I'd sit on the floor, and we'd talk for hours and hours and hours. Let's tell the audience a little, little bit about this, because that's one of the stories that stuck out to me. Um, you, in the case of this gentleman, you were actually seeing a full-body appar apparition, correct? Yes. Yeah. And you describe his, his clothing and... Um. I guess from what I'm understanding 
from a lot of paranormal investigators is that that's actually pretty rare to see an apparition in that much detail. Is that right? It is pretty rare, but when you're a medium, um, I see what the spirit or ghost allows me to see. As a medium, do they immediately know that you have that ability? Can they just kind of feel that from you? Yes, yes. Um, I use the analogy, think of it as a light that you turn on outside in at night and every bug in four counties are drawn to that light. <laughs> to, them, right. to them, I'm at me and other mediums, we're that light. And so I guess that they're drawn to us like, you know, a bug to a light. And I guess they also in, want that because they realize you're the antenna that can get the message from them. Yes. Um, a lot of them do. Some of them don't. Some of them think that we're coming in to make them leave or they're mm-hmm. afraid. Or a lot of them are just relieved that finally there's someone they can talk to that, that gets it. Because they've been mm-hmm. trying to communicate with the living for so long and no one has been able to communicate with them. So I ran to, the, to that a lot where they're just, oh, thank goodness you're here. When you, you talk about sometimes when you walk into the market or you go places, you will see people and they have spirits around them. And you mentioned that sometimes you will speak to them and I guess sometimes you just let it go or what, what is the trigger when you finally, if you see, if you and I were to pass each other in a grocery store and you saw something around me, what would cross the line where you would say, you know what, I need to tell Michael that I see this as opposed to just let it go? It would depend on what the spirit told me. Mm-hmm. If the spirit had a message or information that I felt you had to have that was that important, then I would. I mean, you know, you just you just can't walk up to people and go, oh, by the way, did you know that so-and-so's around you? And yes, I see ghosts. And, <laughs> you know, you, you, you tend to get some pretty strange looks if you do that. I get that. And, and you also, you have children who, um, I guess they also have your ability, but they choose not to, to use it. Is that correct? That's correct. And it's a personal choice. Sure. Um, how do they feel about mom and what she does? Um, they think it's cool. Right on. You know, I mean, they'll call me with things that they've experienced and go, what do you think of this? What do you think I should do? And I tell them what I think they should do like I tell anybody else. You know, but they are so used to me doing it and me ghost hunting. And they've just been around it so much that it's kind of their normal now. They're not really afraid of it. Mm-hmm. You know, like my son, he sees... Um, he sees my dad a lot and it doesn't scare him anymore because it's, oh, it's just grandpa. And he says hi and he goes on and does what he needs to do. He sees them in his waking hours or in dreams or no, both? waking or? hours, waking hours. My youngest daughter um, saw my mother's, I'm sorry, my wife's father in a dream when she was very young and uh, told us about it. And that's, that's the only experience within our immediate family that I can point to, but she had, um, at least one dream where she saw, um, my wife's father. Yeah. It's not unusual for spirits to come to you, people in dreams Mm -hmm. because your defenses are down. You're more open to it. And even though you know who that person is, if, and if you know they're they're deceased and they appear in front of you, it's still going to kind of freak you out a little bit. Mm-hmm. So a lot of them choose to come to people in dreams. Then it's like a dream. It's not so scary. Well, you, you're a good person to ask this to because I've, I've waited to ask this for a while. And this is actually personal, but it has to do with what we're discussing, which is I lost my brother in the summer of 2010. And we were not even a full year apart. And I have only seen him in dreams, I think literally probably less than a handful of times. And I don't know why that is. I, when, when he passed away, he had an illness, but he wasn't taking very good care of himself um, as well. But 
I, I don't know. We, I loved him very much and he loved me. And I, I, it just, it just seems, I sometimes wish that I would see him in my dreams more. And I wonder why I do not. Well, it's a, it's a time thing. Okay. Like time is different where they are. Mm-hmm. Like what can be four weeks to us or a month to us might be two seconds to them. Mm-hmm. So it's a time thing. You know, and he died when? In summer of 2010. Yeah, so he hasn't been gone that long for him. Right. For you, I'm sure it seems like an eternity. Yeah. But for him, it's been five minutes. That's, that's, I, I, people have told, I mean, people have told me that before and that, and that makes sense. And yeah, I just, I just, sometimes I just think that, or I wish that, you know, plus, I w- you know that they're busy, you <laughs> know? <laughs> what are they doing? Whatever. It's kind of funny, you know, like with my dad. Um, my dad will come through every once in a while just to come say hi. And I'll go, hey, what's going on? What do you have to do? And he's like, you know, I'd love to chat, but, you know, I'm teeing off with the guys in, tw- in 10 minutes. I got to go. Wow. <laughs> so I think it's kind of what they make it. Interesting. You know, because all my dad's golf buddies are up there, and um, you know, I, I think he's playing golf. You know, <laughs> a lot of it. You know? Well, that's interesting to me because one of the things you talk about in the book, and and this is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around. You're talking about um, the house that you moved into that belonged to your family. Your dad bought it back. Uh, the 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 young man was in the second floor, but you said there were also two other ghosts. Um, one, I believe, was your great grandmother and then there was a and then there was a male figure who you weren't fully certain who he was but my point is it's we you, you would think if they were all in the same locale they would interact and you you discuss that a, bit, a little bit but let's talk about that because if i'm understanding you correctly they don't necessarily have to interact even though they are in the same geographic location right they don't um you know i had a case where we were doing a church and there were two caretakers. One had been back in the 1800s when the original church was built and one was in the 1940s when the addition was put on. And the one from the 1800s was aware of the other one, Mm -hmm. but the other one wasn't aware of him. So they were having the one that was there in the 1850s was kind of ticked off that there was another caretaker in the building because it was his job. So I just had to ne- kind of negotiate a settlement and we were good. So sometimes they're uh, one's aware and one's not. Sometimes they're just not aware of each other because they lived in different times. Sure. That is really interesting. Um, sometimes they are, you know, sometimes they just all cohabitate nicely and sometimes well, they don't. You know, when, I mean, I've had I've had cases where there's been two spirits in a place, and they haven't played well with others, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So you just well, go and you negotiate a settlement. Do I hear a dog? Yes. <laughs> I, I'm a dog person too. No, no, no worries. I, I my dog will probably run here in a minute. Um, one of the houses that you discuss in the book as well, I believe you call it the horror house. I mean, there was just myriad activity going on there, but you make the distinction between residual hauntings and actual hauntings. Can you explain to the audience kind of what you mean by this residual a energy? Residual- Yeah, residual energy or haunting, there's not really a ghost or spirit there. It's just a little piece of time that gets caught in a warp and it replays itself over and over like it's like a tape recorder. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be footsteps. It could be doors opening and closing. It could be a full body apparition, but it's really not. It's just that piece of energy. And in a traditional haunting um, or an intelligent haunting, as we call them, the ghost or spirit will make an attempt to interact with the living in a residual mm-hmm. ener- uh, energy because there's not really a spirit there. No attempt is made to interact because there's nothing to interact with. When you talk about a residual haunting, I'm thinking that there 
in the future, there must be some way perhaps to even measure this because a residual haunting is like an imprint, a dimensional imprint, or there, I, I, I'm just guessing, hypothesizing, there must be some form of way to measure this energy. Um, I'm hoping in the future that we'll prove this because if you're describing a, a person walking up the stairs and people see this clothed individual and it's residual energy and it happens for generations or, or for years, there must be something there that hopefully one day we'll be able to capture and have some form of data relating to it. I hope so. I mean, um, sometimes they just fade out by themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's there's really nothing any paranormal can, investigator can do to get rid of it because there's nothing to get rid of. Right. You can't change time. It's almost like a holograph or something that is imprinted yeah. on the, uh, uh, the matter. You also talk about the idea that the more porous an object it is, the easier it is for um, ghosts to adhere to an object? Yeah, well, uh, energy to adhere to. And, and yes. a residual haunting like wood, stone, you know, anything that, that's porous that will absorb energy, um, I think that's where that energy goes. There's been, there was a case where they uh, tore down a Civil War building and they used the stones in the foundation to build another building. And they had an outbreak of paranormal activity, and it was all residual because all that energy from the Civil War soldiers was stored in that stone, and it just manifested itself. Mm -hmm. hmm. So it's um, it's rather interesting. When you when you get hired, would people reach out to you to take a look at what they think is a haunting, or? you know, some form of paranormal activity taking home in their, in, taking place in their home or property. Kind of walk us through how you would address that. If I come to you and I say, you know, Debbie, I've got this issue in my house. I, I, I really don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a, a ghost, if it's demonic, if it's a poltergeist, or if it's, if I'm just losing my mind. Could you come, could you come out to my house? What, what how would your, you and your team what what are the steps you would take to come to come help? Um, first of all, we do uh, we do a pre interview. Mm -hmm. um, the head of our team will go out there and he'll do an interview. He'll do an EVP session. He'll do a recording. He'll take um, pictures, talk to the people, find out what's going on. Um, we ask a lot of questions. A paranormal investigation is very invasive. Mm hmm. Um, and then we meet as a team, figure out what we might be dealing with so we're a little prepared. And then we go in um, while the guys are setting up all the equipment. Uh, I'm walking around just kind of getting a feel for the house, seeing where the hot spots are, see if I run into any spirits, get a feel for them, feel their energy, try to communicate with them. I try to open up the lines of communication. And then we just, you know, do a do an investigation. We analyze the evidence, and then we report back to our clients what we think they're dealing with. If it's something negative, if it's the negative energy, I try to deal with it before I leave. Because a lot of times, if a paranormal group goes in and you're dealing with a negative energy, um, when you leave. That and that activity could increase, and it could potentially be a danger to our clients. And I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I was listening to one of your interviews, and you said something a little bit surprising to me, um, but it makes sense, and it has to do with when you were with the team and and the idea of salt, because some people have been under the impression that they would put salt around your home, and you were saying not to do that. Don't do that until the activity's over because if you have a negative entity, a negative entity will not cro can't cross a line of salt. So all you've really done if you put salt around your on the out around the outside of your house is you've trapped that negative entity in your house. It has no place to go. So until the house is clean, um, I don't use salt. But and you said that sometimes though you would put a circle of salt around your team to That's protect. To protect yeah. That's to protect them. That's, that I'll, makes sense. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it around my team. I'll put it around the clients obviously want to be there. I put it around the clients 
The only one who's allowed outside that salt is me because if something's going to come at anybody, it has to come after me. And when they come at you, um, I know that you address them sometimes verbally, sometimes telepathically. If they try to attack you, what is your next move? What are you going to do? Um, duck. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, you know, I've had that happen a couple times. Normally they just throw a big wall of energy at you and it just kind of knocks you back a couple feet. And, um, then you just go for it, you know, then it's war. And I have a certain ritual I use and, um, it tends to take care of the problem. Well, you also said something that I, I found interesting as well, and, and I've heard this echoed by some other folks I've had on the show, which is that a lot of time when a lot of times when people think that they may have demons in their home, it's not demons, and in fact, perhaps it's just a ghost that's very desperate. Yes, yes. Um, there are certain spirits that may appear to be violent. But they're really just trying to get your attention. So they resort to very physical measures. Yes. And, and they're just trying to get attention. I mean, there's one case I have to deal with um, when I go out to Iowa. Um, we have a spirit out there that is extremely violent. Uh, it's tried to grab people I know and pull them down to the basement of the house. Mm -hmm. And... Upon further research, we found out there's a sealed cistern in the basement. Yes. And a while back, uh, one of the people that lived in that house, their husband um, allegedly ran off. Well, we had the feeling that he didn't run off and that he's sealed in the cistern. Mm -hmm. So when we go out there, um, we're going to open the cistern. And uh, we have a sheriff on standby just in case we find what I think we might find. And it's not that he's trying to scare people or be violent. He's trying to get someone's attention. Hey, I'm here. Please help me. This sheriff that's going to accompany on you, and, and I do know the story you're talking about in the book. Um, mm -hmm. This sheriff, he, he's aware of, of your hypothesis, right? That, that, that you think there may be human remains in the cistern? Yes. Wow. Yes, he's aware. That's why he's on standby. Sure, sure. Um, and there's there's two there's two spaces within that basement. There's the there's there's the cistern, and then there's another space in that basement as well, right? I I haven't been there. I, I can't say. I don't know. Oh, oh oh. I thought I maybe I misread it, but um, I might be thinking about um, another house that's in there that doesn't have a lot of rooms okay. in the basement. <laughs> So anyway, but, but, but this person, you feel like there's a possibility they're there and that the reason they're trying to drag people down there to the basement is to, to look around and help them be found. Yes, I think so. That's my theory. There's a lot of other spirit activity at that place as well. So um, some of it's residual, some of it's not. So it's going to take me a while to sort them all out, figure out what I need to deal with and what I don't. When are you going to go do that that investigation? Um, hopefully this summer. Mm -hmm. I have that and I have the four horsemen. I have to deal with those a while. Okay, I'm not sure if I got to that one. Explain what, what that one is a little bit. It's not in that book. I don't think I put oh. the four horsemen in that book. Um, the four horsemen, um, back in the 1800s in the Wild West, uh, there was a uh, group of outlaws. And they allegedly killed a family. And six men from one town and six men from another town formed a posse, hunted them down, and killed them. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, the legend is whenever the horsemen ride, people die. Um, the one town, um, it burned to the ground a year later. And it was not rebuilt. The other town's still in existence. So... Um, a friend of mine and I, we pulled the cemetery records for that town. The town only has 150 people in it. It's not hard to, it's only one cemetery. Mm -hmm. And we went through every single year, marked how many people had died. And then, uh, because one of her relatives lives in that town, 
we um, knew when the horse, we knew the years the horseman rode. So we compared that to those years to the cemetery records, and we found out that yes, the Vanna Horseman Road, more people in that town died. And what was interesting is the people, a lot of the people that died in those years were direct descendants of the men who were in that original posse. Interesting. Yeah, it's all circumstantial. I don't know if they're residual. I don't know whether they're intelligent. Um, my guess is that they're intelligent. But the only way to find out is um, to trigger them. When I know what their trigger is. And stand in front of them when they start to ride. See if they ride through me or around me. Mm-hmm. You know, if they ride around me, they're intelligent. If they ride through me, they're not. Yeah. I don't know of another way to do it. I get it. At one point in the book, you, and I believe this is the same house we were talking about a moment ago, um, but but you, you describe, and this is probably residual, but a ghost model, a automobile, um, I believe, that had been involved with a in, in an automobile wreck. Yes. You know, which which, which so. was, yeah, which is interesting to me because when people think of ghosts, they think of them being an anthropomorphic sense, you know, being a, a human or maybe even a spirit animal. But, but then you think about ghost boats, ghost ships and things like that. So when, when I saw the, the model a, tell me about that. Is that just a residual energy? I'm pretty pretty sure it's a residual energy. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I was never really sure about that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's residual because I can't imagine me. A car doesn't have a soul. Right. You know, and, um, you know, ghost ships, I'd love to investigate ghost ships. It's just, it's impossible. I mean, I live on a lake. I've never seen one. It's impossible to predict when they're going to show up. Sure, sure. Um, well, the reason I just put that out there is when I was reading that, I was like, well, that, that was, the, I thought, wow, a Model A car. And then I, the next thing I thought was, well, you know, you've heard of ghost ships. So, I mean, that must be some form of, of residual haunting, it I guess. It to be. Yeah. Or it could be some type of anniversary thing. Ah. You know, where it shows up on the anniversary of its demise. I mean, there's anniversary ghosts. Sure. You got to figure there were humans on the ship and in the car or whatever. So maybe that's, maybe it's the deceased people that were in that vehicle that's causing it to reappear. Well, speaking of anniversaries, can you tell the audience a little bit about the, uh, the woman that appeared in late October in around some people's homes, uh, that you relay in the book? Cause I found that a fascinating story, which you, I think, I believe you call the person, the, the screaming the, lady. Cause she showed up every lady. October. Yeah. Every October she'd show up and, um, she'd just run through the field screaming. And you could hear it for miles. I mean, it's in farmland. You could hear it for miles. And some people, the house that was on the property, it had so many owners. Well, someone finally bought it, and they didn't believe in all this, and they were remodeling. And when they remodeled, they found the skeleton of a baby in one of the walls. And... Some um, the one who'd been in the town forever said, "I wonder if that's the baby that belonged to the screaming woman." Mm-hmm. So they um, actually disinterred the woman, put the baby in its arms, reburied them together, and the woman hasn't been seen since. Wow! So she just wanted to let people know she was after her baby. <sighs> I mean, that's that's love. I mean, love transcends death. You know? Absolutely. Well, one of the things, besides the fact that the demonstration of love being eternal, uh, one of the other things that really surprised me about that story is, from what I understand from paranormal investigators, for a ghost or a spirit to do things, it, they have to get energy and from something. And for the, for this ghost to have emoted in such a loud way for people to hear it. I mean, it's just incredible that they were able to pull that much energy to make that much noise, that, that, that ghost that would do that once a year. Yes. Yes. It is incredible that she was able to do that. Um, I haven't actually looked at how the ley lines fall through that Uh, property. Right. But if I had to 
guess I would say the energy came from a lot of the energy she could pull from a ley line. Um, now we start looking at ley line patterns before we even go out there to see where the ley lines are in comparison to our wherever we're going because that makes a big difference. Do you do that with a dowsing rod or how do you do that? I have a ley line map actually. Ah, okay. And, um, you know, we just, we look at where our location is. We look at what ley lines are around there and we follow them back, Mm -hmm. you know, to see, is there a hub close by? Um, how far back do they go? Mm -hmm. They go back through certain locations in England or Europe. What ley line is it? A lot of them have names and, um, some of them are allegedly more powerful than others. So we pay attention to all that now. I mean, I don't know how scientific that is, but it's something our team has just started to do. Mm-hmm. How many people are in your team? Uh, we have, let's see, one, two, three, four. We have about eight or nine core people, and then we mm-hmm. work with a lot of other teams. Um, if we have a large location, we have other teams we'll work with. We'll call them in to help, and likewise, they'll do the same for us. You know, they'll call us in if they need more people. Because a lot of the locations we do are quite large. They have multiple buildings. It's impossible to cover them all in one night. Sure. That few people. On average, how many investigations do you do per year? Um, probably do between five and seven. Yep. Yeah. About five to seven. And do most most of these investigations result from peach, people reaching out to you or are these – um, things that you found out about and, and researched into to, to find? It's a combination of both. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if we hear about something, we'll, we'll go check it out. Um, a lot of times, people that we've helped before, if one of their friends or relatives are having problems, they'll get, them, they'll get in touch with us. Um, a lot of them have read my book and they'll email me because I put my email in all my books. Mm-hmm. And they'll email me, and um, if I can't help them, like if we're out of state or something, I know ghost hunters all over the country, and I can usually find someone to help them that I trust. Mm-hmm. What are some of the primary tools that you would use when you when you go to a haunting, or that your uh, team would use? I go old school. I go in with a camera and a tape recorder. Right on. Um, the team, you know, we have... Um, I don't know how many video recorders. We have ghost boxes. We have EMF detectors. We have, um, um, I download this amazing app, this thermal camera app on my cell phone, and it, it really works. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Is, that by, is that by FLIR, F-L-I-R? I can't remember what one it is. Okay. It's, um, it's like a thermal, it just has thermal camera, and um, it's free, and it really works. I mean, you know, we'll use that. Um We use anything we can think of. We use, you know, trigger objects. We use um, me, you know. Sure. Um, I know. Think of anything we can think of. We'll try. You know, if we've if we've read about something that other teams are doing, it's like, well, that sounds interesting. Let's give it a try. See how that works. Um, You know, we've switched from regular flashlights to UV flashlights. What's the reason for that? Um. The leader of our group, James, had read a read an article um, about how some paranormal teams have discovered that when they use UV lights, they get more activity than just using regular flashlights. So we decided okay. to test the theory, and so far it's held true. If there's something there, for some reason they're attracted to that black light. Interesting. And it's a lot easier on the eyes because it's purple. Sure. So it's a lot easier on the eyes when you're in pitch blackness than a bright fl- a bright flashlight. And who knows? Maybe it's less intrusive to the spirits themselves. It could be. It could be. Well, another thing you wrote about that I, I found interesting, you, you described something called the fear cage. Could you tell the audience what the fear cage is? The fear cage is if you have a high EMF in your home. Um, a lot of times they're in basements around the circuit box. Mm-hmm. And... And a high electromagnetic field causes actual physical changes in the body and the mind. It can cause you to make you feel like you're being watched. It can 
uh, cause you to see things out of the corner of your eye to hallucinate. Um, it just gives you a general creepy feeling. Mm-hmm. So the first thing we check is that. We always look for a logical explanation before we uh, automatically jump to paranormal. I mean, you know, I got called out one time. These people thought there was something in their family room. You know, it turned out to be a raccoon in the chimney. Hey, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, it happens. And the other reason I knew to look there was because I had a raccoon in my chimney once, and I sure. knew exactly what it sounded like. So, Yeah, raccoons make a lot of strange racket, um, so yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, so, you know, it could be um, you have critters in the attic or, you know, it's a branch from a tree rubbing against the side of the house or a window or, you know, you have pipes that are not fastened securely to the joist and every time the heat or the water comes on, it causes a noise that sounds like footprints. Mm -hmm. So we always, we check everything out before we jump to the conclusion. I mean, unless I walk through the door and I have a spirit in my face, I mean... We try to look for other things. Which has happened. I, I, in your yes. book, you mentioned a couple of times you've gone in places and immediately seen like a smoky fog or immediately encountered apparitions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes they want me there. Sometimes they don't. Um, it's, it depends. You know, sometimes you walk into a place and my team can walk right in. They can walk all over, no problem. I go to walk in, and it's like walking into a wall of energy. It's like walking through jello. Mm-hmm. Because they're trying to push me out. They're trying to keep me out. I understand. And, um, because the, a lot of times it's just because they're scared. And they think you're going to make them move. They, which I am, but yes. <laughs> they don't know that. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we're speaking with Debbie Chestnut, and uh, we're talking about her latest book, which is Stalking Shadows, The Most Chilling Experiences of a Paranormal Investigator. I know we're going to be going to the break any second now, so I want to give you a couple of websites so you can take a look at uh, Debbie's work. She has MyParanormalAdvisor.com. She is on Facebook at Debbie Chestnut. That's just facebook.com forward slash Debbie Chestnut. She is also on the Llewellyn site, and uh, Llewellyn is the publisher that sent me this book, and I thank the good folks, uh, Kate Sanborn and everyone at Llewellyn for doing that. We are going to take a break in just a moment. Go ahead. They can also, uh, my, my Facebook fan page is The Paranormal Realm. Oh, thank you. I didn't, I didn't have that one. Okay. So it's, um, the paranormal realm. So any of these sites, my paranormal advisor, uh, paranormal realm on Facebook or Debbie chestnut on Facebook. And, uh, you can reach out to that, her that way. I think in the second hour, we're going to ask the chat room if they have some questions for you as well. And, uh, I think Joe, do we have anybody that has questions at the moment before we go to break? Not currently at the moment. No. Okay, all right. Well, I keep thinking the music's going to bust in any second now, but I guess it hasn't happened yet. So one of the other things that I want to talk about in the second hour is the fact that you have a book, um, How to Clear Your Home of Ghosts and Spirits, which seems like a question you would probably get a lot. Yes, all the time. All right. So I want to talk about that. And then I also want to ask you about, because I've heard that in Japan, there's actually, well, there's the music. I'll hold on this. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Michael. Jim, no worries. My name is Michael Parker. This is the Electric Pyramid. We are going to take five to seven minutes break. Please come back for the second hour with Debbie Chestnut. We'll be right back.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Electric Pyramid. This is hour two, and this is the 32nd episode of the Electric Pyramid coming to you from Hollyweird, California. Tonight, our guest is Debbie Chestnut. She is a spiritual medium and a professional paranormal investigator. We have been discussing her latest book, Stalking Shadows. And right before the break, we were about to get into the subject of how am I going to get rid of these ghosts that are in my house? So, Debbie, I know you get that question a lot, and I know that you've written about it extensively. If I come to you with that problem and I think that my house has got ghosts in it, what do I do to get rid of them if I want them to leave? The first thing I tell people to do is talk to them. 80% of the time it works. Just That's amazing. You just talk to them. Most of the time you just want acknowledgement. You know, so you can say, um, I know you're here. Um, and then set ground, ground rules. Like, please don't go into my children's rooms. You're scaring my kids. Stop that. You know, I set, you set ground rules for them. And most of the time they follow them. And um, that 80% of the time, it might, you might have to repeat that three or four times. It's not always going to work the first time. Mm-hmm. 80% of the time that works. I mean, obviously, if the spirit is being violent, then I, then call someone. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't try to get rid of it yourself. Um, you know, you can try smudging your house, which is, you know, using a sage, sage stick. I wanted to ask you, I want, explain the idea of smudging to me and, and why that works, what that's um, about. Smudging is, goes back to Native American times. Okay. Um, the Native Americans, a lot of them... Um, use uh, sage and sweet grass. And the idea behind it is if you smudge a property, it gets rid of any negative energy. That's what the sage does. And the sweet grass brings in positive energy. Interesting. So, I'll, you know, people say, well, I've, you know, I've smudged my house over and over. I've had it blessed. Nothing's working. Well, then your ghost is in a negative spirit because it only works on negative spirits. Hmm. So wait a minute. So so if it is a a benevolent or positive spirit, it might not work because it's just it's to get rid of negative energy. Okay. So if it's a positive spirit, um, go back to talking to it. You know, talk to it. Right. Um, Sometimes you can have someone come in and bless the house. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people out there that do cleansings. Um, if you know, if you don't want to go to the church and say, "Hey, I think I've got this in my house," you can take um, objects from your home into the church and have, if you're religious, and have them blessed and then put them back in the home. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that di- works. I mean, the big thing, the big thing is just to talk to it, set rules for it. Um, Eight out of ten times, it's going to follow the rules. I mean, the goal, like when I go in, what I try to do is I try to figure out why it's there, what it wants. Because obviously it wants something or it wouldn't be there. Right. So once you figure out what it wants and you solve the problem, the rest is easy. And it's not easy you know, for, for people that can't do what I do to do that. That's why you talk to them. You know, well, and... Me- Try to figure out, you know, did you used to live here before? Are you the, a lot of times it's the past owner that's passed away. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, the past owners can appear malevolent, but think about it from their point of view. Okay, a lot of times, like an earthbound spirit, they don't know they're dead. So they're still in their house. There's strange people in their house. All their stuff is gone. I mean, think about how confusing and frustrating that is for them. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this, because I, I've heard that before, and, and I know that I'm asking you to think as a ghost, which is an unusual thing. But one of the things that's hard for me to understand is, and I've seen it in ghost movies, and I've heard it from investigators, how does a ghost individual not realize that it's dead? Um, sometimes they've died in their sleep and they've literally woken up dead. Okay, fair enough. Um, sometimes they were killed in 
a car accident or some other type of accident and they died instantly. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they, you know, might have had a widowmaker heart attack. You know, a lot of times I found that with a lot of the earthbound spirits I've had, I've dealt with, a lot of them just don't know they're dead. Wow. And some of them are earthbound for other reasons, like um, maybe they were murdered and the, their family doesn't know who did it. So and maybe they're seeking they, justice. They're seeking justice. That would be an Avenger spirit. And sure. If, if they find the person who wronged them, may God have mercy on their soul because this thing's not going to stop till it's, it takes revenge. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered that type? I have, I've encountered one. Okay. One avenging spirit. And it took a lot of doing. <laughs> it took a lot of doing. Well, how did it. you, how did you handle it? Um, well, first I, you know, I found out what the problem was. And I said, look, mm -hmm. you know, here's the deal. You know, and I kind of explained karma to him a little bit. Sure. And um, it was just a matter of reasoning, and it took a long time. Um, this particular spirit, I went back five times before I got this thing to finally kind of move on. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a lot of talking. You know, it just wanted to be heard. This is what happened. Okay, I get that. I understand you're upset. I don't blame you. Um, but let me see what I can do to help you. Well, you also described that some spirits, they don't want to cross over for various reasons. Sometimes they're scared. It, it, it seems, you know, we're, I'm trying to think like a spirit, but I, it's hard to do, but it seems like they would welcome the, the relief that you would think that it would bring, but that's obviously not the case or they wouldn't be scared. Why are they scared to cross over? Um, in the case of the one man I spent five years talking with, um, he was very religious mm -hmm. and he was not a nice person in life. He'd done some very bad things and he was afraid that if he went into the light that he would be judged and he would be sent to hell. Wow. Yeah. So you have to operate within their belief system. Mm-hmm. And you have to reason with them. I mean, I think sometimes my job is more being a ghost psychiatrist than it is a medium. Understood. You know, because you have to learn quickly uh, where they're coming from. And they, you have to adjust to their reality. Because remember, perception's reality and everybody's reality is different. Mm -hmm. So you have to operate within their reality and their perception of the thing going on or what's bothering them or what they need. And once you can do that, it's just a matter of talking to them. That's amazingly logical. <laughs> it is logical, but it's not as easy as it sounds. Understood. Understood. Um, it's just surprising because I think people, when you tell them to simply ask, they're like, wow, why didn't I think of that? Um, just... If you're scared, a lot of people, a lot of people, they're scared, which is sure. understandable. Certainly. And number two, they get angry and they yell at the spirit. Don't yell at it. Um, I kind of compare it to um, Caesar Milan, you know, the dog whisperer. Sure. Um, he always says when you're dealing with a dog to go in with calm but assertive energy. Mm -hmm. It's that same same type of energy you, you use with a spirit: calm but assertive. The goal is to let them know you're the one in control, not them. And you literally have to reclaim your house. You have to claim your house is yours, not theirs. You have to take your power back. Well, that brings up an interesting point. When you say calm and assertive and I don't want to say courteous, but, but, but it's respectful. So what about these television shows where these investigators are going on going on and, and challenging them and yelling at them and um because i i don't i don't they're, feel they're, great they're, about that when i see it yeah they're provoking yes and because they're trying to get a response mm -hmm. and i'm not a big believer in provoking a spirit agreed 
Um, it also makes me question their credibility. Um, it, it's, I, it's not just that, but um, think about how you'd want to be treated. Yes, yes. And, you know, I go in and I treat them with respect unless they give me a reason not to. If they give me a reason not to, well, that was their choice and I'm going to respond in kind. Mm -hmm. But I'm still not going to provoke them. Because, what? you know, until you know exactly what kind of spirit you're dealing with, if you go in and you just start provoking something, one of these times you're going to poke the wrong thing with a stick and it's going to retaliate in a very bad way. I understand that. What What do you say to people who are using tools like Ouija boards and things like that or, or just the – the easy access to tools like Ouija boards. What do you think of that? I think that if used properly, no, that's the wrong word. If you know how to use them properly. Yes. Um, it's still dangerous, but, you know, you, you might be okay. Um, I'm not a big believer in taking those types of things in because you're just asking for more trouble. You're opening a door between this world and the next. And if there wasn't something bad there before you're opening the door and something could come in. Agreed. So, um, there are other ways to communicate with a spirit besides a Ouija board. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go in with a pendulum and you know, if it goes back and forth, like just, if it goes in circles, it no, it's no. Yeah. You described that in the book. Um, how did you know to do that? Was that just something that you intuitively knew or some, or you had read or someone explained to you? Cause I, when, when I read that, I was like, well, that makes sense. But how did you figure that out? Um, I actually had someone, uh, tell me about it. Mm -hmm. And normally I don't use anything like that because I don't have the need to, but when you're with a team and you're being videotaped every second you're in the house, Mm -hmm. you're going to have an hour of me standing there doing nothing because I'm communicating telepathically. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I just do it for the camera so that they can get the answers on tape. So when we play it back, we remember what was said and what, the, you, what the responses were. When you communicate telepathically, do you, do you hear have like a clear audience? Do you hear them or you, do you just understand the message? Um, it depends on the spirit. Sometimes they'll talk to me like you and I are talking. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they show me pictures. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they show me like movies. Um, sometimes they show me things that make absolutely no sense. But if I relay them to the, to the client, they'll go, Oh, I know what that means. You mean like just symbols or pictures or something yeah, in random like if, order? You know, like if they hold out a red rose, uh -huh. that means love. Yes. So that means I was supposed to tell the person that they want me to get the message to that they love them. Okay. Each medium has their own little set of symbols that means whatever to them. Mm -hmm. But some things you just got like, you know, I had one spirit, um, show me a movie. It almost looked like a movie in my head of the village that they lived in when they lived in Europe. So I tried to remember all these details from this movie so I could tell the client what they were showing me. And they recognized it as the village that this person had lived in when they were in the old country. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's like that. Sometimes... You know, it's just a lot of different things. Sometimes they say things that make no sense and you just have to, or they, and you have to relay it to the client because it means something to them. It doesn't sure. have to mean anything to me. It has to mean something to someone else. Sometimes they're straightforward. Sometimes they just come up and they go, hey, and you have a conversation and mm -hmm. that makes my job so much easier. Sure. But sometimes they communicate in a foreign language and you have to kind of tell them, you know, could you speak English? Sure. Because I can't understand you. You know, sometimes you walk in on arguments between two spirits that, like I walked in one time and um, there was a mother and daughter who were both deceased and they were having a huge argument. And I had to kind of decipher the uh, the argument 
to tell the client their what was going on and why they were so upset. And do they probably argue like that throughout eternity? No, they were arguing because I was there. Oh, okay. And they knew I could hear them and translate and tell the living uh, person what the deal was. and Because they were mad at her. Interesting. Yeah, it was a mother and her daughter. And then it was the, another daughter that was living. And there was another sister that was living. And they were mad at my client for how she was treating her living sister. Okay. Well, one was mad at them. The other one wasn't. Mm-hmm. So they were arguing and it was, it took a long time to sort out. We got it sorted out. Holy cow. Yeah. So that, yeah, that would, that would, that could be confusing. Let me ask you this. Another thing I was going to ask you before the break is, is I've heard that in the last few years, there has been a bit of a fad in Japan um, in real estate for people actually wanting to buy um, usually condominiums or apartments because houses are difficult to afford there. But um, there's actually a market for haunted um, places to live. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yes, yes, I have. And it's because the properties are devalued. Ah. They can get them cheaper now. In certain countries, I think Hong Kong is one of the cities. Yeah. Um, they're having a problem now that landlords don't want to rent to senior citizens because if the senior citizen dies there, it devalues the value of the apartment. And then they have to they have to declare that because the person died on the premises. Yes, yes. Interesting. Okay, um, because I I was wondering if 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 people were wanting these properties because they had the ghost, but what you're saying makes more sense. They want them because they are now devalued. Yeah, they're cheaper. Wow. Okay. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Um, interesting. What do you say to, I know you have a book about this and I don't want to give it all away, but what do you say to the amateur ghost hunter who wants to, or the person who aspires to be a ghost hunter? What, what are some do's and don'ts that you would initially tell them? I always tell them to hook up with a good team in their area Mm -hmm. and go hunting with them. Um, I always tell them that if you can't control your fear, it's probably not for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I would tell them always get permission before going on so much property. Mm -hmm. Um, I would tell them keep an open mind. It's just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right. And, you know, be careful. Don't go in there and poke something with a stick. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know what it is, don't mess with it. Find someone that does. You mentioned in one of your stories, uh, you talk about a property where a friend of yours just couldn't resist and actually went to the property. And I think this is one of the stories we've already discussed, but we didn't talk about this aspect. Uh, The woman actually went to the property investigated it on her own and that's not a good idea no we never go alone um i never go to a property alone um at least you have at least one other person with you mm-hmm. you know never go by yourself um it's just too dangerous you never know what's going to happen you don't know what you're dealing with when you walk in the door um you don't know the people that and there's you, no one to assist you, you and there's you, you no can't. one to help you there's no one if something bad happens there's no one there that can help. So you never go alone. It's just, it's just too dangerous. I mean, that seems fundamental and obvious. And yet with the, with the rise of the popularity of paranormal television shows, I'm guessing that this probably does happen more often than we would want to think that a, that an arrogant young ghost hunter or thrill seeker goes to an abandoned or decrepit place and is completely unprepared. Well, yeah. I mean, if you go to a decrepit or abandoned place, I mean, what happens if you fall through the floor? That's right. You know, what happens? What happens? You can get hurt. Um, you can get arrested. Um, sure. You know, I mean, like when we go into a place, um, if it's a public place, like, you know, if we're going, to, we're going into a cemetery or another public place, um, we always stop by and tell the police department, local police department, we're going in. 
Mm -hmm. And this is, this is how long we're going to be there. This is what we're going to be doing. Please feel free to send a car or send an officer out if you want. If you want, we don't care. We welcome it. Police officers on the night shift, they're your best source of information on where the haunted places are because they know them. That makes sense. I know it's getting late for you, so I don't want to keep you too no, long. We're, I, we're fine. I'm hyped up on caffeine. Cool. Me too. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you about ghosts around water because we've talked about different types of substances uh, or, or you know, porous things they can latch on to. What about ghosts ar- around water? You know, it seems to attract them, and I think it's the energy in the water. Sure. And... Um, I, I can't explain it. I mean, I know that where I live, I live on a, actually, I live on an island. And, um, you know, there's a lot of paranormal activity in here, and it's just the water. It's are you, are you, just, you're, it's, you're, just, it's like an energy source. You're adjacent to the Great Lakes, right? You're in Michigan, or? Yeah, I'm on Lake St. Clair, which okay. um, connects the Detroit River to Lake Huron. Mm hmm. Well, if you go up the St. Clair River, but yeah. We're like the. Other Great Lake. <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. So, 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 what you're saying is, you believe that they're attracted to the the energy of water. I think they're attracted to the energy of water, the pureness of water. Um, I know that there are some paranormal investigators that believe that uh, demonic entities can come up through old wells and they follow water. Really? Yes. Okay. I mean, I you know, I almost have to believe it. Sure. You know, I've, I've dealt with a couple, and where they've been, there has been a well. It doesn't have to be in use, an old well, an abandoned well, and it's been right there. That's creepy. It is creepy. <laughs> <laughs> it is creepy. So, so you're saying that you that they they tend to follow this water up through the faults of the earth into the into the well and. It's possible, you know. There, sure. Any any spirit, any type of entity, well, almost any type of entity, um, is like water. They're going to take the path of least resistance. Mm-hmm. Water, electrical lines; those are all the path of you know, least resistance for them. What would you say is the most haunted place that you've experienced? Mm. Wow. I would have to say there's this cemetery, and cemeteries normally aren't haunted. That's an interesting idea, that they're not haunted. They're normally not, because what tie does the living have to them in life? That's true. That's they true. They go back to places they love. They go to where the people they are loved are. So it's very rare for a cemetery to actually be haunted, although there are some that are. And there's one that... Every time I go in there, something different happens. We get tons of EVPs. I've had, I've uh, been there in the fall, and I've been walking through there at night, and I've literally had footsteps walking beside me, and there's no one beside me. Mm-hmm. But I can hear the footsteps crunching in the leaves, and there's no one there. Um, if you go in there, even during the day, and you just sit quietly, um, you have to really pay attention, and I learned this the hard way. I broke the cardinal rule. I did, wasn't paying attention, and I just went in there, and I was just sitting down. I was actually doing some historical research for the Historical Society, mm-hmm. and all of a sudden, something caught my eye, and I looked up, and I realized that I was surrounded by dark shadows, and they were behind tombstones. They were behind trees. They were by trees. They were at a respectful distance. But I was completely surrounded. Never let yourself get completely surrounded. Why were they doing that? Were they, were they observing you? Were they offended by you? Know, you? I don't was... know. They, they wouldn't communicate. Um, they weren't shadow people because usually if you walk toward a shadow person, the shadow person will take off at the speed of light. Mm-hmm. And they held their ground, but they would not communicate. And you I, I didn't a... feel threatened. I, don't, I never feel threatened by them. But it's kind of unnerving because you don't know who they are because they won't communicate. They won't fully show themselves, so you can't tell what they are. Did they seem to be part of a group, or did they come up into bit independently? Or They kind of um, 
Sometimes the, it varies. Sometimes they'll come independently. Some will come one or two at a time. And if you watch for it, you can back out of there so that you're not surrounded because I'm not sure what they are or what they want. Mm-hmm. Um, although they've never threatened me. They've never made a move to threaten me. Um, I don't know what they are. So I can't pick up any energy from them. I can't get a reading on them. I can tell they're not really negative because I can feel that. Uh-huh. I, I don't know what they are. It's still a mystery to me. Well, let me ask you this, because you brought up the, the idea of shadow people. And I listen, I until about five, seven years ago, I'd never even heard the phrase shadow people. What, in your opinion, are shadow people? And how do they differ from a ghost? I am not exactly sure what they are. Right. I think they're a type of entity. Okay. Um, there are some people in the paranormal community that believe they're a type of demon, but I don't think they are. Um, they seem to be more afraid of us than we are of them. They're kind of watchers. I think they just watch. They're a type of entity that just observes. I mean, I have a shadow person in my house. Um, Currently? Yes. Okay. Um, he's, he's been there since I moved in. Uh, my cats pick it up a split second before I do. And um, usually it's when I have my back turned and I have this big circular staircase that comes down in my house. And when I'm watching TV, it's like to the side. I can't really see it. And all of a sudden I'll see my cats kind of look up at the stairs and I'll turn around and you can see a dark shadow figure. You can see the figures around the railing. And once he sees that I've seen him, it's obviously a man. It looks like a man. I don't know a man. Once he realizes I've seen him, he takes off. He wants no part of it. Hmm. Have you tried to communicate to him? I've tried. They they make no effort to communicate. They don't want to communicate. Um, in fact, it's been my experience with the shadow people I've run into that once you acknowledge them, they're gone. So I think sometimes um, shadow people get confused with types of entities that can appear as a dark shadow. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes there's mistaken identity. Because I have never encountered a shadow person that in any way was threatening. Ever. Mm. I've encountered dark shadows that were threatening, but they were not shadow people. What do you think of the idea that this is a multiverse or that are that somehow there are multiple dimensions interacting and that perhaps when people see ghosts or these types of entities that we're actually seeing perhaps something that is in another dimension and it's not really interacting with us, but it is kind of operating in proximity to us. I think that's highly possible. I think it's highly possible. I think there's a lot of dimensions that science hasn't discovered yet. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that would make a little bit of sense if that's the case is, is is when these entities, whatever they are, whoever they are, are there. It's not a residual haunting, but but they're there and they don't interact with us or seem to notice us. No, they notice us. They, they totally do. No, they totally okay. notice us. They um, they're watching. Okay. And they're just observing, and I don't know what why. Um, they're kind of an enigma. They're voyeuristic. I, yeah, I find them fascinating. Yes. You know, I do. I find them absolutely fascinating. I, I don't think they're going to hurt anybody. I don't feel threatened by them at all. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you mentioned in, in an interview I was listening to this week uh, that in all of your investigations, I believe you said that there was less than a handful, maybe four, that you thought were demonic. Three. 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 Well, that's that actually makes me feel better. <laughs> tell 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 me about that. Um, one, the first one I ever encountered was in the same house as that man that I spent five years in. Yes. Um, I spent five years getting rid of it. Um, I'd never run into one. A lot of it was my fault. Um, I was so curious about it, and I, at first I didn't know what it was. So I went in there and broke my own rule. I kept poking it with a stick to see how it would react because mm-hmm. I wanted to learn about it. I wanted to know everything there was to know about it. And then it started going after my friends. 
when you were uh-huh. on the premises? No. Um, like if I, you know, I tell over my friends, hey, there's this house, it's bizarre. You know, there's something there, I'm not sure what it is. And I drive them by it. And within a week of driving them by it, either they would be in a car accident and one of their family members would get sick or be injured or something like that. So I quit taking friends by it. I quit talking about it, which is the worst thing you could do because demons want to isolate you. Mm. So then it started to attack me in my own house. I got attacked three times by it. And um, thank goodness I had a friend online who was a demonologist. And because I'd seen it, he actually showed itself to me one time. Um, He was able to identify what one he thought it was. And, um, you know, it it took a long time. Um, You know, I had the chance to destroy it and I didn't take it. And I kind of wish I had, but at that time, my thought process was, you know what, if I take you out, that makes me no better than you, and I'm way better than you. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the most part, it leaves me alone now. It pops, it'll pop in, I don't know, once or twice a year, just let me know it's still around, but it won't really do anything. It just, just enough to let me know it's here, and then it's gone. Yikes. And I'm not even afraid of it anymore. Okay. I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, because you can't give up your power. Mm-hmm. And then, let's see, the second one, um, actually, the second one was an elemental. What does that mean? An elemental is a nature's, nature spirit. Okay. Um, they're born of one of the four elements. They can only be... They can only come if they're summoned through a uh, form of chaos magic, like uh, dragon magic, voodoo, hoodoo. Um, and they're given a specific mission. By the person who? By the person who summons them. Okay. And the one I ran into um, was in an old barn. The barn had been used um, a long, long, long time ago. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Mm-hmm. And the person that owns it happens to be a doctor. And he was digging in the barn. He had a, has a dirt floor. And he was going to put in a water line. And when he was digging, he found the bodies of two babies wrapped in blankets. And he was literally grabbed and thrown 30 feet across the barn. And he reburied them. And he... Debbie? Joe? I am we met- I, I'm checking out Debbie here. We think we lost her for a second. We- Hello, Debbie. Are you there? Yep. We're having a little difficulty with Debbie, everyone. I'm sorry about that. We're going to try to get her right back here as no worries, swiftly Debbie. as possible. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Parker with Joe Kiernan. We are speaking to Debbie Chestnut here on the Electric Pyramid. We're having a, a bit of a, a Skype issue, which we're going to sort out, and uh, hopefully she will be back with us shortly. I'll tell you what, Joe, when I hear those demon stories, it creeps me out, wow. man. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. <laughs> is Debbie back? Nope, not yet, sir. Hmm. Okay, we're going to do that there. There. Okay, we're back. Hello, Debbie. Yes, you are back, and we are live. I'm okay. sorry. We lost, we lost you a little bit. Uh, when you, when, when we, when you, you faded out, we were discussing the fact that he, the doctor reburied the two bodies. Right. And then um, he was grabbed by something he couldn't see and thrown across the barn. <sighs> okay. Other teams went in there. But they went in there with the intent to get rid of it. Mm-hmm. And they had iron pipes thrown at them. They were throwing. It was horrible. So I went in. Our, my team went in. And I said, look, here's the deal. We're not going in like this. And I walked in. I said, look, here's the deal. I know you're here. I don't really care. I'm not here to get rid of you. I just want to know your story. Tell me your story. Mm-hmm. And you could feel the whole energy in the barn just drop. And uh, then it started to play with us. Then it um, it was so pitch dark in that in the loft, and we were up in the loft. And I thought my partner was standing beside me because I could see it's something even darker, in the shape of a guy standing next to me. And I saw so there. Hey, did you see that? And I went to touch him, and my hand went right through it. And it got me three times that night. It was just playing with us. 
Hmm. And then we figured out that what had probably happened was um, during one of the Underground Railroad stops, there might have been a couple women who either had a stillborn or lost their babies, and they were buried, and they had used voodoo or hoodoo to summon a elemental to protect their their babies. Wow. Okay. And because um, the, the guy who owned the barn, he had a young son who played in that barn all the time, and nothing bad happened to him. Nothing. So this was obviously summoned to protect children. Interesting. So once, once we kind of figured it out, um, you know, it's been pretty good. It's been pretty good for the guy. You know, nothing much has happened. He's um, He stays out of the barn pretty much, and he built another barn to use for his horses and things. And they're cohabitating quite nicely now. Well, I saw something on YouTube. Uh, I was doing a search on you and looking for things that were out there. And I saw a a short uh, video slideshow. Uh, do you know what the one I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. So I was going to ask you, um, do you have additional footage or, or photos of entities that you've been able to catch Um there's some on my website. Um, the head of the team that takes care of all that, so he pretty much has all of them. Oh, okay. Um, um, does, I'm not does, a big fan of putting that stuff on the out there. Why is that? Because you don't want people to take it, or is it just bad vibes? Um, I don't feel that ghosts or spirits should be exploited. Interesting. Okay, gotcha. All right, yeah. Um, or, or used, or yeah, you know, they were once human. Most of them were once human. So it's almost a spiritual privacy issue. Yes, I get it. I and and all the listen. I the only reason I was asking is just because I'm curious and I wanted to see more. Um, but but that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there's there's pictures on my website. There's um the guardian of the gate at that cemetery. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a picture most people look at. It's in front of this old house, and people think it's an angel, but it's not. It's the demon. How often do you encounter spirits disguising themselves as something other than they are? Not very often. Okay. Not very often. I mean, about the only thing that that really does that is a demon. But um, once you know what that energy feels like, it can't fool you because while a demon may be able to change their appearance, Mm-hmm or how they appear to people, um, they can't change the essence of their energy. Mm -hmm. So if you could feel the essence of their energy and you know what negative energy feels like, like true, pure, evil energy, and you know what the reaction that your body has to that, Mm -hmm. I don't care what they appear as, I'm going to know it. Like for me, when I'm around something that evil, I get physically sick. I get nauseous. I get dizzy. Um, quite easily. I mean, this thing's trying to zap all my energy, so you know you can't fight. Mm-hmm. When when entities attach themselves to a person, because we've we've discussed how they can attach themselves to a piece of property or a mm-hmm. uh, piece of furniture or a stone or an object, but when they attach themselves to a person, how, how does that work? And and what does the person feel? Um, they're kind of, they're also called uh, parasitic entities Mm -hmm. and a demon normally is not going to attach a a, a demonic attachment is different than a a spiritual attachment. Okay. A spiritual attachment, what they're doing is they're basically using your energy Mm -hmm. and they're kind of of like an energy vamp Mm -hmm. and it's going to wear you down physically and eventually you're going to get sick. And you're going to die unless something's done to cut that cord. Well, then do they just move on? Because if, if the host dies. If the host dies, they're going to move on. But um, it, it, it can go on for a period of years. Mm-hmm. Um, a demon isn't that patient. Not even close. Right. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, that's kind of the difference. That's how you kind of know. You know, a demon's not going to be patient. A demon's going in for the kill. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, a spirit normally won't. I mean, I don't think that when a spirit attaches to you, I don't think their intent is to kill. I think they just need the energy. Mm -hmm. um, whereas a demon, it, it has a total different intent. I understand. Well, let me ask you this. If with these spirits that are attaching to you, not so much for malevolent reasons, but really just to sap your energy. Um, why is that? What, 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 what are they, well, what are there's, they? There's a lot of theories on that. Sometimes people think that, um, the spirit misses being alive. Right. So they'll attach to someone. So to them, it's almost like being alive again. And they re-experience life they in some fashion. experience, like, let's say that the person they attach to hates um, some type of food. Mm -hmm. But the spirits attached to them love that kind of food in life. So all of a sudden, that person might start eating food they absolutely hated because that's what that spirit wants. Or they might start smoking, or they might start using drugs, or you know, it could be a lot of different things. And the spirit is actually influencing what they're doing. It's not the same as a possession because the person still has free will. Um, in a demonic possession, the person no longer has free will. I I saw something recently. Um, I don't know if we should say the man's name, but it's easy for anybody to Google. Maybe it was on one of your sites or something. But um, a very well-known ghost person on television had purchased this home that was, I believe that, there were numerous demonic entities in it. And I, I don't remember if the man was wanting to shoot additional television shows there or to research he's making, it. He's making a documentary. What do you think of that? Honestly? I mean, it seems dangerous to me. What do you think? It is. It's very dangerous. And, you know, you can't, and I'm not saying this is what he's thinking, but you can't think you're above it. Maybe it's just trying to document what's going on in that house, so that's fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I know production was shut down at one point, and um, priests were brought in. Mm -hmm. And um, then they started shooting again. I think he's finished with the documentary. But um, and it's going to be released this fall, I think. But um, I'm not a fan of that. Right. I mean, if you know something's there, go in and try to help the family. Don't exploit it. Sure. And I'll be honest, I was actually even on some of these stories. I'm, I'm uncomfortable even reading about them because I don't know. I, I would never be arrogant around this type of material or, 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 or these types of entities. So it's, I almost get uncomfortable reading about it. And it seems like what little I did read about that house initially, it was incredibly disturbing. It is. It's incredibly disturbing. And, um, you know, I don't know. I, I see it kind of like an exploitation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not into that. You know, my goal I, is to go in there and help these people, not exploit them. Right. Did those, those people left the home, right? I mean, they didn't stick around, did they? I'm not sure. I yeah. think they did, but I'm not sure. I can't say. Sure. Right, right, right. I mean, I, I hope they did. But that doesn't guarantee anything anyway. Mm hmm You know, I mean, if the if the demon that's there has chosen its victim, there's no place you can run. It just it's, moves it, with you. It's, it's going to follow you. So I just hope he took proper precautions and kept himself, his team, the crew, and those people safe. Mm-hmm. I know I wouldn't want to work on that show. Uh -uh. I, I, I've I've worked on television in production, and that's a show I wouldn't have wanted to uh, have been part no, of. No, but think. there's there's a lot of those shows on TV I would want to be a part of. So that's just right. me. Let me ask you this: um, How many of those shows on television do you think things are staged in? Mm, it's impossible to say. I would say most of them. Right. I because. Uh, 
I have a background working in production on reality television. People ask me all the time. I mean, I haven't worked on any paranormal shows like that, but I've worked on other types of reality shows. And people would always ask me how much of things were staged. And obviously, when one watches a uh, show like this, the first question you would have would be, gosh, I wonder how much of that is staged. And um, I think that is one of the primary criticisms that many of those types of shows draw is the question of how much is real and how much is, you know, affected or essentially staged. Well, my thing is, is like every time something happens doesn't mean it's paranormal. That's true, too. You know, why aren't some of these shows looking for the logical explanation? There are some that do, to be fair. Yes. But why do some of these shows automatically jump to the conclusion that they're dealing with something paranormal? I mean, look at some of the places these people go. You know, I mean, there's bound to be natural things going on there, logical explanations for probably 80% of what's going on there. Right. That makes sense. And that's my argument with them. You know, plus I think that, just my opinion, that a lot of the people that produce these shows or order these shows don't believe in ghosts to begin with. They look at it as entertainment TV. You're exactly right. Yes. And, um, yeah, it, it can be entertainment TV. But, like I said before, just because you don't believe in something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I would agree with you. Let me ask you this. What is next for Debbie Chestnut? What is what is going on uh, for the remainder of this year and uh, in the near future? Do you have more books planned? I know you have several investigations planned. What's on your radar? Um, right now I'm finishing a book on exorcisms. Oh, That'll be done in about six weeks, hopefully. You are quite prolific. Um, yes. Yes, I am. Um, I'm going to be uh, doing some traveling this summer. I'm going to be uh, going out to Iowa. I'm going to try to get back up to Minnesota, uh, work with a couple teams there. Um, I want to uh, get more into urban legends and, uh, you know, try to track down what's causing those and see what's going on with some of those. I mean, we have some great mm-hmm. urban legends around here and mm-hmm. in Michigan, and I want to just kind of, you know, explore other things. When you say you're doing a book, finishing up a book on exorcisms, did you, did you witness some exorcisms as no. research? No, I, um, yeah. You know, it always starts at a bar, right? I was, uh, <laughs> yeah. I was uh, visiting my publisher, and my editor and publicist and I went out to dinner, and we were at the bar. And my editor said, "You know, I really need a book on exorcisms." And I'm like, "Oh yeah, I can do that." So, uh, you know, I took my experience with demons and uh, did a lot of research, and I'm. Uh, I'm working on that, um, exploring, kind of really exploring um, the possession syndrome. When you say syndrome, do you, possession syndrome, what do you mean by that exactly? Um, In the world of psychology, there are some people who honestly believe they're possessed and they're not. Got it. And it's almost like a mental illness. Mm-hmm. So um, they kind of call it the possession syndrome. Do you think that makes up a majority of of the cases that eventually lead to exorcism? Or, or? no, not always. Um, in some cases, for sure. But then again, I think there's probably a lot of mentally ill people that are in institutions that don't belong there. Agreed. Because maybe they have a spirit attachment. Maybe, you know, they're being oppressed by a demonic entity. Um, It's just an area I'm exploring a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm working on in the immediate future. Um, When is that? Huh? When do you anticipate that book being out? That'll be out in 2016. Okay. Probably fall of 2016, I think. Through Spring Llewellyn fall. again? I'm not sure. But there's nothing coming out this year for me. Okay. okay. 
um, I kind of took a hiatus last year, a little bit of a hiatus. I uh, had two books come out last year, and, you know, I just wanted to uh, live life a little bit. I understand. You know, plus we were, I was pretty busy with some investigations and, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, we have a researcher on our team, so we were, we've been researching a lot of things. Understood. We tend to do a lot of that. Um, yeah, just spending time with some friends and family and um, real life, good life. Real life, yeah. You know, sometimes real life you have to live it. You know, you can't spend your life behind a computer. I hear you, ladies and gentlemen. We've been speaking with Debbie Chestnut, and uh, her website is my parent. My, sorry, I can't even speak. MyParanormalAdvisor.com. dot com. You can also find her on uh, Facebook. And I'm sorry, give me that Facebook address one more time, Debbie. Uh, the Paranormal Realm. Paranormal Realm on Facebook. Her personal page on Facebook is just Debbie Chestnut. And you can also find her on the Llewellyn uh, website. And if you're wondering how to spell Llewellyn, they're a great publisher. It is L L E W E L L Y N. She has several books on there and actually a couple of articles as well. And Debbie, thank you so much for staying up late with us and, and coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Hey, it was my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Good. As soon as that uh, exorcism book is out or you come up with some great uh, stuff this summer with your investigations, please let us know because I'd love to have you back on the show and uh, talk some more. Oh, I will for sure. All right. As soon as we get this archive up on YouTube, which will probably be in the next two or three days, I'll let you know and hopefully you can share it with your with your readers. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Parker. We've been with uh, speaking with Debbie Chestnut and my producer, uh, Joe Kiernan, and uh, we're going to be wrapping this up probably within the next few minutes. And uh, Debbie, anything before we get out of here? Um, if people need to email me, you can email me at debbiechestnut at yahoo.com. I answer all my emails, believe it or not. And I can speak to that because I, I emailed her and uh, she got right back to me. So I, I can give testament to that. It's, you know, I like to be in touch with people. I like to hear what they're going on. I like to answer questions, you know, help as many as I can. Well, you have a very pleasant personality and you're fun to talk to. And, um, and I, I really do thank you for coming on the show tonight. I, I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Michael Parker. This has been the 32nd episode of the Electric Pyramid. I appreciate all of you staying up late with us. I, uh, the chat room, thank you for, uh, we didn't get your comments tonight, but I saw them, and I thank you for that. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, triangulate the truth. Good night and good luck. My name is Michael. I'm out. Poem to the book on a long life. Mars On the desire of happiness. Cosimo de' Medici to Marsilio Ficino. Greetings. Yesterday I went to my estate at Carigi. Estate. Come to us, Marsilio, as soon as possible. Bring with you potato. Highest good, which I suppose you translated from Greek into Latin as you promised. I want nothing more wholeheartedly than to know which way leads most surely to happiness. Farewell. The Book of the Sun. A soul. Marsilio Ficino. Introduction. The Book of the Sun represents the culmination of Ficino's life and work, published in 1494 
five years before his death. It is a supreme example of the very synthesis of astrology, religion, and philosophy for which Ficino strived his whole life. And he illustrates with his ability to convey the deepest mystical experience within a lucid, authoritative prose. In the dedication to Piero de' Medici, Ficino tells us that the origins of the work is the metaphor of the sun in Plato's Republic, and that he was inspired by pseudo Dionysus. On the same subject, Ficino's new reading of the Republic passage was destined for the third edition of his Plato translation, patronized by Piero. In an apology to Filippo Valori, Ficino begs Valori, now Florentine ambassador to the Pope, to defend him against future accusations of heresy stemming from his two little solar works named De Sol and De Lumine, for which he had already prepared himself. He precedes the De Sol with a preface to the reader in which he explains how his book should be interpreted, interpreted as an allegorical and analogical sense rather than dogmatically. A sentiment echoed in a letter to Palaziano dated the 20th of August, 